Hello, um, welcome to today's webinar, Achieve Enhanced Cloud Security with Data Loss Prevention. My name is um, Sascha Schwangenberg. I'm a security engineer here at Lookout. And i like to welcome Anvesh, my colleague. So Anvesh, if you give a little introduction of yourself. Thanks, Sasha, for having me. Hello, everybody. My name is Anvesh Marvredi. I'm one of the security engineers who look out for the uh, SASE product portfolio. Thanks, Anvesh. Yeah, so let's start uh, with a quick uh, agenda introduction. Um, yeah, so we'll start uh, what, what is Lookout, who is Lookout, where we started and what we did today. Um, then we like to show you some um, cloud security statistics. So what we collected um, some statistics around threats in general, um, some statistics around mobile security and some statistics around data loss. Um, yeah, then um, what is SASE? Just a quick um, introduction, uh, which components are part of it. Um, why organizations using data loss prevention, uh, prevention or should use DLP, uh, maybe easier to say, for the future, and then uh, gain visibility with Lookout Security Cloud. And uh, lastly, um, Anvesh will run a CASPI demo for you. Um, yeah, overall, it will take around about 50 minutes, maybe. Um, so let's see, let's start now. Yeah, um, so let's start uh, with the Lookout security graph um, and uh, who is Lookout. Um, so Lookout was founded uh, 2007 um, as a mobile security company. Um, it was dedicated um, yeah, to build security for, for mobile devices. Uh, we started for sure uh, with um, Symbian and, and Windows Mobile back in the days. Uh, then we um, yeah, straight away went to Android and uh, iOS when it was released by Apple. Um, we found in the initial days um, that um, companies didn't take care of um, vulnerability management, for example, on um, yeah, Nokia devices for sure uh, uh, was one example. So what our founders did was um, they attacked um, or they proved with an attack um, that uh, devices are running um, yeah, Simeon on, on a Nokia devices uh, um, they are able to attack them with a Bluetooth sniper rifle and get the contacts, uh, contacts from the celebrity, uh, celebrate, uh, uh, celebrities uh, on the red carpet on the Oscars ceremony. So that was one proof to show, okay, there's a security hole uh, in the whole operating system and um, Nokia was not able to, to fix them um, because there was no vulnerability management present um, yeah, as you see today. Over the air updates um, are, are everywhere, and vulnerability management is one big topic. Um, vendors um, doing quite a good job, I would say, but quite often uh, we see that uh, companies uh, didn't do a great job in doing vulnerability management. So that means a lot of devices are still out there uh, running old uh, systems or operating systems or outdated um, uh, patch levels, and um, that would be one of the starting points um, uh, if you like to have a higher security um, for devices. Yeah, um, the Lookout security graph in general, uh, we preloaded um, Lookout Consumer Edition um, a lot um, with, with carriers out there. Uh, one example here in Germany is Deutsche Telekom, the, so they're preloaded. Uh, look out um, to their devices um, and uh, we reached um, through that process and uh, through other processes um, more than 200 million devices and this is a unique capability because we have the biggest data set out there um, yeah um, with with those uh, more than 200 million devices and the same process um, uh, we started quite early uh, with uh, nowadays more than 150 million apps. Um, so what we did, uh, we, um, we acquire apps from the official stores, Google Play, Apple App Store, uh, every um, web resource. So web crawlers is one example. And even um, on mobile devices, we are able to uh, do binary acquisition processes. So that means if you are maybe the only one in the world um, are targeted by maybe a, a dedicated attack against you, um, Lookout um, for work or Lookout consumer is able to do a binary acquisition. So get the binary 
and um, yeah, our AI machine learning process can start uh, building coverage um, for new families out there. Um, yeah, so let's move to the um, local security platform. So the platform describes um, all of the capabilities that we have. Uh, on the left side, it's it's mobile oriented. So with our MES product, um, what that includes is um, endpoint detection and response. Um, so stuff like um, root and jailbreak detection, um, yeah, malware detection in general on, on devices, vulnerability and patch management. Uh, I discussed that uh, already. Uh, risk and compliance, uh, phishing and content protection, one of the most prominent um, attack vectors out there. Um, yeah, so with users working from everywhere, um, it's the easiest way for, for hackers to attack someone um, is, is through um, phishing and content, uh, uh, through a phishing attack. Um, yeah, so prominent attacks here are uh, maybe the the WhatsApp campaign that we we saw. Um, so people receiving just an incoming VoIP call or um, incoming GIF image, um, or it could be a social engineered SMS, whatever it is. But it's uh, the easiest way to attack someone. Um, yeah, secure web gateway um, is one component, um, and then everything around SASE uh, user and entity behavior analytics, zero trust network access to get access to your uh, on-premise um, um, products. Um, cloud access security broker, um, that means um, providing uh, security for your cloud services uh, with inline and, and API-based uh, connections. Um, digital rights management and DLP, uh, what we will uh, cover quite extensively um, in today's webinar. Yeah, um, yeah. So, what's the mission? Um, it's all about data today. So, um, what you have to make sure is uh, keeping um, your data secure, no matter where it's stored. So, it could be, um, yeah, your cloud. It could be your uh, on-premise um, server. Um, that's the main uh, goal: is to keep your data secure, maybe encrypted, uh, maybe compliant with regulations. Um, so um, Lookout has more than a thousand um, capabilities uh, to do something uh, with your data and make sure it's compliant with your regulations. <clears throat> yeah, um, one important piece is um, respecting the end user's privacy, um, that they don't feel uh, spied on um, and have a good feeling if they work with the data you are providing or they will creating. And um, yeah, one important piece as well um, is to make sure that uh, you are reducing the cost and complexity that is maybe um, currently ex existing. Yeah, the challenge um, is that you no longer have control. Why is that the case? Um, so if we maybe looking back um, 10 years ago, everyone was using um, yeah, it's called a perimeter. Um, why? Um, yeah, you build your own castle and everything was in, inside of this. Um, the employees working in, in buildings, in, in company buildings, um, you using on-premise um, services uh, with servers that are part of the perimeter. So everything was protected against um, an attack from outside of the perimeter. That changed dramatically especially uh, when the uh, COVID pandemic, pandemic hit, hit us and now um, people are working from everywhere. So um, that's not the case um, anymore. Also with mobile devices and with, with yeah, um, other device types, um, the parameters I would say nearly gone. Um, for sure, there are still some services running in a parameter, um, but everyone is using um, O365, Google Workspace, whatever it could be. Um, so SaaS services are, I would say, uh, at least prominent or even dominant um, nowadays. Um, yeah, um, a patchwork of apps. What that means is uh, that we are running um, SaaS services and even um, yeah, call legacy, legacy apps. Um, yeah, just for business purposes, they are still out there, um, and um, 
they're currently it's maybe the stage where companies are shifting them as well um, to self services also to to reduce cost uh, to make the life of the employees easier uh, with better end user experience um, devices and networks aren't in control um, yeah people are working from home that means they're not part of the um, um, the network that you created with with a proxy with with some controls in it and and security uh, so they're just using their personal Wi-Fi whatever that could be it could be um, just their mobile devices using tethering it could be maybe a little fritz box whatever it is and you have no control over that and uh, lastly employees are using unapproved sub software what is that um, it could be um, yeah, stuff like whatsapp or telegram that will leak data um, like contacts um, everyone that is using whatsapp uh, or starting whatsapp initially will receive push notification uh, can i get access to your contacts if the end users say yes uh, the contacts are gone are leaked um, to cloud service um, stuff like that um, and even it's called shadow it so if you say okay uh, my approved uh, cloud service is o365 um, they can even maybe use box or dropbox whatever it is um, to share and collaborate um, with their data yeah um so um you're definitely limited uh, with the existing tools what it means um, using vpns for an example um, vpns are um, i would say dinosaur to uh, technique or technology why uh, they're designed um, to grant access uh, to a parameter so if you um yeah have the castle that is protected and you want to grant someone access to that castle uh, that was the purpose of introducing a VPN technology. Um, what is the issue with maybe uh, VPN technologies? Um, they have latency, latency um, in, in connection. Um, they're slowing apps, maybe because um, it's an always on VPN and you like to use web services. Web services are normally using um, UDP um, yeah, transfer protocols, and they're quite often not support, supported within a VPN. That means you fall back to a TCP connection and the end user experience on a on a web stream or on a webinar is terrible and that could be related to your uh, VPN technology. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's the reason um, why you have to uh, buy tools for the new requirements and um, that's that's um, yeah one issue because you have your old um tools you buy new tools and um they are quite often edge or point solutions and they don't uh, work together so they have no integration to each other uh, the administrators have multiple consoles for it and the end users have multiple end user um, products end user tools um yeah so that's um the issue with deploying zero trust tools or with with tools that um um, don't have any correlation to each other. Yeah, um, so what we did, uh, we collected um, some statistics um, to show you the risk that is out there and, and what happens uh, every day. Um, so 36% um, of every organization has leaked or suffered um, a serious cloud leak or breach in the last year. Um, yeah, so 36%. I would say is a is a really high number, um, and now let's uh, break that down uh, where where they're coming from. Um, Eighty percent of those um, organizations um, or those breaches are attacked by by a vulnerability um, in in cloud uh, services or even on premise or um, endpoint vulnerabilities. Um, yeah, so I said that initially. Uh, make sure. Um, that you do a great job um, on vulnerability management, um, not even on not just on your servers, um, do it as well on your endpoints. So that means PCs, Macs, um, Android devices, iOS devices. Um, that those eighty percent um, can be lowered uh, to to a really low number, uh, because vendors out there do a great job in doing patch management today. 
but it's um, yeah about the administrators to to succeed and to force the end users um, that they are doing uh, updates and being out of compliance if they will not start the update process within a couple of days, for an example. Yeah, 47% of security professionals say they need better visibility into their cloud environment. Um, what is that? If I share data, if I work together on, on cloud data, um, yeah, it could be encryption. So if I share something sensitive, um, yeah, the visibility is gone. I have no clue who shared which document with which um, recipient. So this is uh, one thing um, on the 47%. And um, then lastly, we have two numbers here. 24.5% um, uh, of mobile devices are affected in general with threats, but 40.2% um, um, encountered a phishing attack. Um, so here I'm living in Germany. I received a lot of um, phishing attempts um, through SMS in the past weeks. Um, they're always related to um, some um, parcels I should receive, like tracking links or um, click here to um, define a new day or uh, make sure that um, the parcel um, is on the right spot or it stays here, some, something around that. And, and they're using um, services like DHL or Hermes or whatever it could be here in Germany um, to drive attention on that. And um, yeah, that's one way um, or the easiest way to attack someone is, is through phishing. And uh, that number, um, I would say, proves that because 40% uh, um, is a really high number. Yeah, so um, let's explain in, in a couple of words what is SASE. Uh, so SASE is the um, terminology um, or a word created by Gartner, um, an analyst firm. And um, it, it com contains a lot of, I would say, security products related to um, cloud services. Um, so one big portion of that is CASB. Uh, CASB is uh, cloud access security brokers uh, that um, will um, applied to your cloud services. And um, another component is zero trust network access. Um, that is the part um, for your on-premise um, web application or web applications, for example, to make them um, um, accessibly um, secure, like you maybe did before with, with a VPN approach. Um, secure web gateway. Um, and lastly, uh, data loss prevention. Um, for sure, all these components uh, will work together in the SASE world. Um, yeah, so CASB including DLP and maybe including the encryption um, is just one component in the end for the end user, but uh, in the terminology SASE, they are um, yeah, separated from each other. Yeah, what are the most prevalent risks um, to your organization's data? Um, Ransomware attacks, for sure, all about uh, all of us know them. Um, they are, I would say, quite dominant in the press. Um, data leakage via collaboration. Um, yeah, visibility, we mentioned that as well. Uh, what happens with the data if you share it with someone? Is it an internal um, employee? Is it someone externally, maybe from a partner? Uh, what happens with the data? Um, and and yeah, gaining visibility into that that is one one piece uh, where you can reduce that risk. Uh, insider threats um, and uh, compromised accounts, um, compromised accounts um, and devices is also quite often related to phishing attacks. Um, so if I would be a hacker, I would start sending you a phishing link. Uh, and I will try to compromise the device maybe with a root. If that is not successfully because your device is uh, fully patched and the vulnerability management was done correctly, then I'm, then I try maybe to just compromise the account um, through a credential theft. Um, yeah, so that's the, the risk here. 
Yeah, let's continue with uh, some other examples. Um, so I found a quite interesting number here. Um, 4.4, 1 million is the average cost of a data breach in the United States. And um, yeah, that's a really high and scary number, I would say. And um, that is part of um, a report we found out there um, cost of data breach from IBM is the resource. So if you are interested even more in that number, um, yeah, you can have a read through. Um, what is the, the, the part of the data breach or what includes in a data breach is um, um, highlighted here. So just a few examples. Uh, yeah, passport numbers are included, credit card information, um, medical patient records, user credentials, including IDs and passwords, uh, so social security numbers, email and contact, contact information. Um, everything here is, uh, I would say, PRI related, contains um, sensitive data and um, is mostly a nightmare for uh, the companies that are affected by those data losses. Um, it's normally not just internal data, it's even uh, data from, from customers. Um, so they have to make it public. Um, they yeah, have to uh, pay a fee. Uh, and and um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a long process to get away from um, the data loss uh, to make sure your reputation is, is good again. And, and there are many processes around the data loss. Uh, just a couple of um, companies that are affected on the right side. Um, so I would, I, I'm sure you um, know a lot of them. Yeah, so let's talk about uh, DLP and uh, a CASB com comparison. Um, yeah, so, so if you start with a cloud services, um, cloud services, um, it normally didn't include any DLP or CASB functionalities. Um, yeah, it's the initial way to start with that. And then uh, maybe you like to introduce uh, DLP and, and even CASP. So um, yeah, what's, what's missing? Um, for sure, no data classification um, to detect and uh, catalog sensitive information uh, wherever it lives. That is the, I would say, first and most important piece when it comes to uh, DLP and CASP. Uh, data scanning, so you have to make sure that um, structured and unstructured, unstructured data um, is scanned. Um, yeah, visualization of the data, um, yeah, wherever it is on the users or device contacts, how he is handling with that data, uh, even stuff like um, OCS scanning, um, so identify, classify, and protect sensitive data in in a format like maybe. A uh, picture or PDF um, that is uh, something um, you can reach uh, through CASB. Um, also, even scanning historical data and, and real time sets. So, historical is the data that is already present um, before you introduce a service uh, with um, or protecting a service uh, with CASB and DLP. And real time data is the data that is created. Um, after that, so on uploading, downloading, or creating new data sets. Yeah, um, I would say this is um, most important on that slide. Um, if there are any upcoming questions, uh, we are always happy to support you and explain that even further for sure. Um, yeah, why organization organizations using uh, CASB uh, and DLP? Um, yeah, so Anvesh, maybe um, just one question that came to my mind or was present quite often um, back in the days. Um, so what do you think uh, threat actors have evolved their tactics recently uh, such that uh, DLP uh, is so important to have in place here? Yeah, great question, uh, Sasha. So uh, we've been witnessing how threat actors have continued to explored every crack in the digital world. And when it comes to cloud applications, especially uh, invariably they start with either a credential theft 
or a phishing attack or exploding some compromised credentials. And this is how data gets stolen um, uh, from back doors. So uh, now DLP uh, is, a, is a very effective tool. It's not just for governance and compliance, but even for data security. And if I have to go to a couple of examples, um, uh, organizations and employees, they download data from the clouds into personal devices. And it's easy to share data from these cloud applications to external users. So this is where DLP can, uh, can come in, uh, examine the sensitive data and take that remediation action to ensure that uh, the data is not lost or data is not breached. So uh, it, DLP is a very, very effective uh, solution for that. Right, thanks. Yeah, so a couple of more examples, but I'm going to explain that quite, quite good already. Um, so why organizations using DLP um, for sure uh, discover, classify, and protect PI and sensitive data. Um, yeah, so what happens with that? Uh, you like to gain visibility. Uh, if you have a large uh, and distributed organizations, many uh, people work from everywhere, so it's definitely just dis more distributed than it was. Um, compliance things like um, PCI, HIPAA, uh, GDPR things. Um, a collaboration, you like to enforce or strict uh, people from doing something. Maybe, um, yeah, they uh, sometimes sharing sensitive data with externals and they are not aware of it or it will stay forever um, and is accessible to the outside world, not even maybe just for a couple of minutes because someone didn't have any cloud account, but it stays there forever. Um, so more rules and, and, and strict uh, enforcements around that and productivity. Um, so you like to give end users the access even on BYO or unmanaged devices. Yeah, um, so if we make that maybe even more visible, I would say that was um, a great example how it looks at a lot of infrastructures out there. Um, so what companies did, they starting with their house or with their uh, main service, and then they're ex extending that with point solutions. And um, what is the pain of it or what is the, um, the challenge with it. Um, even um, if you have the best point solution, it will not communicate and, and, and integrate uh, to the other services. And um, yeah, you have to use multiple logins, multiple credentials. Um, there's no built-in security to one and the other service. So um, yeah, maybe that explains that better than every word. If you have a look at the picture, um, this is uh, the, rea the reality out there. Um, yeah, um, I would now have another question to unleash. Um, maybe uh, talk about encryption and when people uh, talk about DLP, what do you think, how does that play into uh, it? And especially on platforms like um, O365 and, and uh, Google Workspace. Yeah, definitely. And encryption definitely plays a big role um, in the overall uh, solution um, like, like TLP. Uh, there's only so much you can do with access controls and, and authorization. It works for infrastructure and applications, but, but not so well for, for the data itself. Once you download data or share data, uh, it has its own it has its own life basically, right? So that's where encryption uh, can come in and give the control back to enterprises. And uh, the nature of the encryption should be in such a way that organizations can still collaborate while protecting their sensitive assets. So it definitely plays a very big role. Yeah, thanks. Um, and this is. Um... Yeah, my last slide before we start into the demo, um, but it shows um, how an advanced data loss prevention concept looks like. Um, so there's a unified um, policy console, um, then lookout DLP got supplied to every service that we are, we are using. And um, this includes um, yeah, advanced contextual policies based on, based on a cloud device and, and risk activity content. 
Um, it can apply uh, content rules. Um, so we have out of the box more than a thousand uh, compliance rules um, and um, cloud native DLP. That means uh, support for API and inline um, protection. Um, yeah, policy actions, just to, to name a few of them. Um, it could be block, it could be coach, it could be maybe a step out authentication when you when you think the end users may be in a risky scenario that um, a second or third factor um, will get introduced um, to make sure it is the end user and the employee that should use that service and not a hacker. Um, it could be watermarking sensitive data to say, okay, um, everyone is aware that uh, he's now working uh, with sensitive informations uh, and, and multiple others. Yeah. Um, so I would hand it over to Anvesh uh, for the demo. Thanks, Asha. So uh, as part of this uh, demonstration, um, we're going to look at the visibility aspects of the Lookout Caspi platform and how it helps organizations um, uh, get visibility into the overall cloud usage, for example. How can organizations enable controls uh, to their sanctioned applications with zero trust principles? And uh, we'll also look at some use cases around uh, DLP, data classification, and the EDRM technology for encryption, as well as some uh, threat prevention capabilities uh, that the Lookout Plus Caspi platform brings to the table. Okay, so uh, if we actually uh, start off, uh, the, the Caspi market uh, started uh, a few years ago trying to solve the, uh, the shadow IT problem. So um, what you're looking at is the, the shadow IT dashboard of the Lookout Caspi platform, which is a result of the cloud discovery process. And it gives a high level risk status overview of the overall cloud usage and also categorizes the, uh, the applications depending on the kind of service they provide or the, uh, the industry uh, that they belong to. And uh, if we actually go into a little more detail, um, it, it's not just about getting visibility into the clouds that are being used. It's also important to know how much data is being exchanged uh, with these cloud applications, gives a sense to the organization um, if sensitive data is leaking into these unsanctioned apps. And uh, more importantly, every cloud app that's discovered is assigned with a risk score. And this risk score is calculated taking into account multiple attributes and they are broadly categorized into four areas, which is environment, compliance, privacy, and, and security. Within, these, within each of these categories, there are um, multiple sub attributes. Uh, for example, in compliance, you look at uh, ISO 27001 as a standard. And um, all these are taken into account and a risk score is assigned to each application, one being the least risk and 10 being the highest. And once the clouds are discovered and the risk is understood, um, organizations can now think about blocking such an, uh, certain risky unsanctioned applications. And from the Lookout Caspi console, um, organizations can generate access control lists and feed that into their enterprise web proxies and do the actual blocking there. Also, uh, within the shadow IT discovery process, it's equally important to understand the users who are using these unsanctioned apps and how much data they're exchanging with these applications. And uh, administrators can uh, obviously get a nice little report from the console in terms of the overall cloud usage and there is a neat executive summary. Uh, highlighting the uh, the applications and the categories they belong to. So at this stage, the organization has some visibility into the overall cloud usage. They can now start to think about the controls they want to put in for their sanctioned clouds. And for this demonstration, we'll take Office 65 uh, as, as an example. It starts off with a simple onboarding process. And within the Office suite, um, organizations can choose to uh, protect individual applications like OneDrive, SharePoint, Teams, et cetera. And uh, this is a layered protection model uh, that the platform brings. And each of these protection models directly or indirectly contribute to uh, enabling DLP for uh, sensitive data. And we're gonna look at uh, use cases 
uh, that fall into uh, each of these protection models as we move forward. So once the organization onboards the application to the platform, immediately they start to realize the benefit of it uh, in the form of getting deep visibility into the activities that are happening uh, within this sanctioned office application. Right, right from uh, top five downloaded files, for example, from a content standpoint, or from a device or an operating system standpoint, uh, organizations can understand what kind of devices users are using to access the, uh, the application. And uh, even in terms of geographic location, uh, login activities and any content shares happening, organizations can start to understand the trends and how users are uh, actually using uh, the system, which is very powerful. So, so organizations now have deep visibility into the uh, overall usage. And now they can start to think about um, what about the, the controls that they can put in to this office application. And this is where the zero trust principles come in with context checking. So let's take an example here. This is a, a low risk user trying to access the office application from a managed device. Um, and as you saw, uh, the, uh, the integration with the Okta platform or the single sign-on platform comes in um, and uh, the, pl the platform, the Caspi platform is checking the context and uh, then uh, allowing the user according to policy to access the, uh, the sanctioned office application. And a single policy can be uh, extended to multiple clouds. And in this use case here, you're seeing uh, the same user trying to access the sanctioned box application, for example, goes through the same uh, authentication process and uh, is able to access the application because he or she is coming from the right context. Right, so, so let's take an example of uh, a situation where a high risk user is trying to access the same sanctioned applications from their personal devices. And uh, again, the same um, integration with the IAM platform comes in. And uh, as the user authenticates, the Caspi platform checks the context sees that it's a high risk user, and also sees that it's a personal device, it's an unmanaged device, then according to the policy, uh, it's blocking the access to the, uh, to the office application. And as I mentioned before, a single policy can be extended to, to multiple clouds. Uh, there's no requirement to have multiple policies to achieve this for multiple clouds. And in this use case here, you will see that the same high risk user trying to access the, uh, the box application is denied uh, access because a high risk user and the device is a, is a personal device. So this way organizations can uh, start to put um, login access controls. And uh, if we're actually talking about mobile devices, uh, in this use case here, we, we're checking the context of the device operating system and also the fact that it's a personal device. So in this use case here, uh, this um, iPhone is my personal device and this user uh, is, is trying to um, access box uh, from the mobile device and we can deny access uh, from mobile devices completely, uh, taking into account the operating system if they are personal. Right, so, so these are a few examples of login access controls. So this is the first level. So once the user is given access to these cloud applications, now they start to interact with them by uh, let's say uploading data or downloading data to these applications. And in this use case, uh, let's say an employee uh, is uploading a, a medical record to, uh, to Box and uh, is trying to, uh, let's say, now download the same document to the, uh, to the managed device. So this is one of the policy actions that organizations can take to basically coach users when someone is trying to download sensitive data uh, to, let's say, managed or unmanaged devices. And this justification that user is providing uh, can be tracked in the activity or it logs by the administrators to understand why uh, users are uploading or downloading sensitive information uh, to these clouds. And uh, if we actually uh, uh, look at the document itself, the reason that tr this triggered the policy is that this document contains some PII data in the form of, let's say, social security numbers. And uh, that is the reason why the user coaching uh, was triggered by policy when the attempt, the download attempt was done. So let's take an example um, of um, an employee uh, doing certain activity in SharePoint. Uh, this time to a particular site, uh, uh, the employee is uploading a document 
which is classified by Microsoft's AIP platform or MIP platform as confidential. So this time the CASP platform, the Lookout's CASP platform is checking for the classification that's there on the, on the document. And uh, while the upload is allowed uh, to, the, uh, to the sanctioned SharePoint application, when the download is attempted to, uh, to let's say, a manage to PICE, this time uh, we want to uh, trigger um, uh, encryption on download, right? So uh, when the download is complete, before it reaches the endpoint, we are applying encryption to the document. That's an option that organizations can take when users are downloading sensitive documents. And uh, this encryption is combined with uh, the rights management and the decryption of the document is again controlled by an authentication process. There is a lightweight decryption client that's available for all the major platforms that uh, employees and users can use. And only after a successful uh, authentication and authorization, according to the policies, the user will be allowed to uh, decrypt the document and uh, use the contents inside it. So, so this decryption process is also a controlled one and organizations can have policies to restrict it to a certain users. Well, let's take an example of the same download activities, but this time they're happening from a personal device or an unmanaged device. So the employee tries to download the same medical record uh, to, to an unmanaged device. So this time we are triggering step up authentication. So this is where integration with uh, MFA platforms comes in. And only after a successful validation of let's say a security question or a passcode, the download is allowed. And even when the download is allowed, uh, you can choose to protect the document before it reaches the endpoint in the in the form of encryption. Right? In certain cases, you may not even want to allow downloads to happen uh, to personal or unmanaged devices. And in this use case, the the user is trying to download uh, an, a, a confidential document to the personal device, and there is a policy which will prevent the download uh, from happening completely to the uh, to the personal device. So these are a couple of examples of how we are taking into account the context and also the content and uh, taking necessary steps to prevent data leakage. So if we actually dive a little deep into the, uh, the encryption capabilities uh, that the Lookout Caspi platform brings, because of the fact that uh, it's got rights management embedded into it, uh, there are certain controls that organizations can put in in terms of content exploration, um, you, you can choose to set the expiry to let's say a week or 15 days and after that the document is not usable. And more importantly, this style of encryption is collaboration friendly. So uh, let's say an organization has SAP success factors as the cloud and they want to share a report to their payroll provider, which is an external party. They can do so uh, using the encryption technology in a secure fashion by defining rules on who can actually decrypt the documents and work with it. So, so this is a really uh, a powerful way of collaboration um, in a secure way uh, with, uh, with external parties while having full control over data. Now, uh, while it's important to secure a data uh, in the web channel, uh, I, I personally believe that data can leak very easily in the form of emails. Uh, it's just a simple case of adding an unauthorized recipient to the email and let's say uh, in this use case, I'm trying to send a medical record copy or a snapshot in the form of uh, uh, an image which contains some uh, PII data. So in this email, I have an internal recipient, have two external recipients uh, in it, and there is some sensitive data in the attachment. Uh, when the email is uh, received uh, uh, by the internal user, you'll actually notice that first of all, the platform is able to recognize the image and sensitive data in it using optical character recognition, and it's able to apply encryption. And secondly, it removes the unauthorized Gmail recipient uh, from the CC list and only allows authorized recipients. It, it can be even external, uh, depending on the, uh, on the policy uh, that is configured. Right? And uh, another uh, important uh, use case when it comes to uh, collaboration uh, in, from platforms like SharePoint or OneDrive, it's easy to right-click on a document 
and say share it uh, to uh, uh, anyone outside the organization, right? So it's easy to uh, define a bunch of email addresses who are external users or partners. Um, and uh, it's important to get visibility into the and, and ensure the data is not being shared to unauthorized recipients. So in this use case, I've shared it to Alex Wilbur, who is an authorized external recipient, but I've also shared it to my Gmail address, which is not an authorized recipient. And uh, there is a policy uh, in the platform uh, which says that if a document containing PII data uh, is being shared externally, um, I would want to allow only that uh, share to exist only to the authorized third party recipient, which is Alex Wilbur. And I want to remove the collaborator on the, uh, on the Gmail or the personal uh, email addresses. So as you can see, uh, when the policy uh, takes the uh, action, uh, you notice that it's only uh, Alex uh, Wilbur that continues to have access uh, to the document, whereas my personal Gmail address is removed from the, uh, from the collaborator list. So this is again a, a very important use case when it comes to collaboration platforms to ensure that data is not shared. Um, uh, there's no excessive sharing of data to unauthorized recipients. Now, in terms of threat prevention, which indirectly uh, contributes to uh, data loss prevention, uh, the Lookout Caspi platform has uh, an antivirus and anti-malware engine as, as users upload documents, there's continuous scanning of data. And if the platform finds any uh, infectious files, uh, we can completely deny the upload from happening to the cloud, in turn protecting the assets uh, in the cloud. And when we talk about threat prevention, uh, outside the traditional antivirus and anti-malware checks, we can also integrate, the platform also integrates with third party uh, threat providers into, uh, in the form of, let's say, fire eye detection on demand to detect uh, those uh, zero day vulnerabilities. Now, while it's important to check that, uh, it's also important to understand the user behavior and uh, detect any threats uh, that may result in deviations in, in user behavior. So this is an example of a geolocation uh, anomaly. Uh, this is basically driven by the user entity and behavioral analytics out of the platform. So a uh, certain activity has happened in a certain geographic location and within an hour, there's been another activity from let's say 8,000 miles away so this is uh, impossible to happen for the same user to be in two different locations in such a short span of time. It's a geolocation anomaly and it could in indicate a credential compromise threat and uh, the platform is able to detect and send off alerts to the administrators. And in terms of the content, uh, anomalous downloads by size is basically to check any data exfiltration attempts that are happening, any large number of downloads which are uh, not normal uh, for that particular user. And uh, uh, another type of anomaly that the platform looks for is anomalous content deletes. These are signatures of uh, ransomware attacks, um, uh, which where there are mass renames or mass deletes happening uh, in the cloud and the platform is able to detect and alert the, uh, the administrators. So uh, in the beginning of the demonstration, uh, we, looked at the, we looked at a use case where we looked at the user risk as a context and the factors that are contributing to calculating the user risk is the, the number of DLP violations, the malware count, and the uh, anomalies that they generate over time, and that contributes to the, uh, to the user risk. So from a compliance uh, standpoint, uh, there is uh, an important uh, piece in the platform called Insights Investigate. First of all, organizations can manage all the violations in the form of incidents. And secondly, and more importantly, what this Insights Investigate gives is it gives the opportunity for the organizations to track, let's say, uh, movement of a sensitive piece of information across the cloud landscape. Right? So in this use case, I want to understand uh, a particular document's movement across my cloud landscape and who are all the users who've been acting on it for the last one month. With just a couple of clicks, the organization is able to understand the users who've acted on it and from which geographic locations the document was downloaded to or uh, uploaded from. And in terms of applications, what are the sanctioned applications the document was put into? And in terms of collaboration, if this document was shared to any external users uh, in, that, in that time period. So it's a really powerful tool to, uh, to understand the, the, the different contexts surrounding a particular entity. And the foundation for this, as you can see here, is the, uh, is the fact that we are auditing every activity uh, that uh, the, uh, the users perform in the cloud applications. And all those activities are presented in the uh, the console in the activity audit logs page. 
And finally, from a reporting uh, standpoint, uh, again, uh, there, there's plenty of options in terms of what kind of reports uh, organizations would want to schedule. And these can be scheduled as an on-demand or a schedule for a fortnightly or a monthly report. And in terms of the types of reports, uh, we'll look at an example of a compliance uh, report for Office 65 and uh, the, the amount of uh, detail that the report provides to understand the, uh, the, the overall cloud usage uh, within the organization. So policy hits over time is one metric that you can track and who are all the users who are generating the most number of violations. What are the policy remediation actions taken as a result of these violations? So all this uh, information can be, can be consolidated uh, uh, into a report and they can be scheduled to be sent to the, to the right recipients within the organization to get complete visibility into the, uh, into the cloud usage. So uh, to conclude, uh, the, the combination of uh, contextual login access controls combined with uh, data loss prevention and data protection in the form of EDRM based encryption technology and uh, threat prevention uh, can give organizations that comprehensive uh, cloud security strategy. Thank you. Back to you, Sasha. Thank you, Anish. <clears throat> yeah, so I would like uh, to thank you uh, for your attendance. I hope uh, you found it interesting today. Um, if you have any upcoming questions, if you'd like to have a meeting together with us, we're happy to support you on that. And um, yeah, thanks for the uh, thanks for attending today.